Good evening. Hi. Thank you for joining us for tonight's event featuring Professor Susan Napier. My name is Christy Endo from the college class of 2005 and David Sussman, Aki Oshi, and I organize events for the Tufts community in Japan. We have a very interesting topic tonight with roughly 100 RCVPs uh, logging in from around the world, including some of Professor Napier's uh, former students. Um, one thing uh, I'd like to know, we really encourage you to keep your cameras on so we are all more connected. Before I introduce tonight's amazing speaker, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to recently admitted students who are logging in tonight. And now some words about uh, Professor Napier. Uh, she is the Goldweight Professor of Rhetoric at Tufts. She was the Mitsubishi Heavy Industries Chair of Japanese Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. Raised in Cambridge, Massachusetts, she became interested in Japan when her mother, an art historian, took her to see the East Asian collection at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. She first traveled to Japan at the age of 17 and lived in Tokyo teaching English and studying Japanese. She received her degrees from Harvard and has been a visiting professor there in addition to University of Pennsylvania, Keio University in Tokyo, and Sydney University in Australia. Professor Napier is the author of numerous articles and five books, Escape from the Wasteland, Yukio Mishima and Kenzaburo Oe, The Fantastic and Modern Japanese Literature, Anime from Akira to Howl's Moving Castle, and From Impressionism to Anime, Japan in the Mind of the West. Her most recent book, Miyazaki World, which I started reading over the weekend and is available on Amazon Japan, was published in 2018 and has been translated into 10 languages. Professor Napier is the recipient of many fellowships and awards, including a Rockefeller Foundation residency at the Bellagio Institute in Italy, a National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowship, a Social Science Research Council grant, and a Guggenheim Foundation grant. She lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts with her husband, Steve Coit, an artist. As you'll find out today, she is known to be a very cool professor on campus and we're so lucky to have her tonight. Without further ado, please welcome Professor Susan Napier. Um, thank you very much. Uh, can you all hear me? Just wanna make sure. Good, and um, very, very glad to, hear, uh, to be here and thank you for the introduction. Uh, and thank you all for coming. I'm so pleased that some of my former students are here. I also can see that an old friend of mine has, uh, has tuned in. I'm, I'm very excited to be here. Uh, I don't, don't that frequently get a chance to address such an international crowd. So that's very exciting. But also I gather from Jabari, who thank you very much for, for helping to organize this event, that there's also a very, very wide generational mix, which is kind of exciting to me because I'm looking forward to uh, in the Q&A and maybe later on, uh, getting uh, all your different perspectives on uh, Studio Ghibli. And I really, really kind of excited to see the variety and range of people who are, who are here today, um, this morning, tonight, whatever, whatever time zone we're in. So uh, without more ado, I'm going to share my screen. Right. Okay. Um, I wanted to um, talk about Studio Ghibli because I believe that what's happening in the world today is that more and more we are getting away from a, a, a hegemonic American worldview of the way things work and that we are more and more uh, aware of other people's uh, ways of approaching the world, of approaching nature, of approaching politics and culture. And it seemed to me that Ghibli was, was a really good way of kind of looking at this because it's a, it's a small animation studio, but it has really outsized impact. It's now globally known. It's streamed on Netflix. It's streamed in, in, um, in America on uh, HBO. Uh, and this has been quite an amazing change over the years from, from when it started as a, you know, kind of a little studio of many uh, back in the 1980s. Uh, and 
one very important thing, which is why I've called it a tapestry of light and dark, is it, it's an entertaining, delightful studio, but it has many, uh, with many fascinating and delightful works, but it also has, uh, it's, it has a complex and very interesting side to it, which is what I'm going to be talking about uh, today. Um, this talk is really based on a book that I'm currently writing, which is called Provisionally, um, how did, uh, let's see, The World According to Ghibli, uh, How a Small Japanese Animation Studio Changed the World. This is provisional. Um, and that book is actually based on a class that I gave at Tufts last semester called Disney, uh, Walt Disney Studios meets Studio Ghibli. Uh, that was a comparative course uh, that uh, I never taught anything like that before, but it turned out to be quite successful. I had uh, 40 students sign up. And uh, they really got into kind of comparing the two very different worldviews of the studio. Um, in many cases, they um, a lot of them sort of knew about Walt Disney, but also, and may, may be surprised by this, many of them came in because of their love of Ghibli and that, and they had grown up with Ghibli. These are American students, French students, Chinese students, uh, and Ghibli has become an important part of their, their world. Uh, one thing that's very interesting is that um, I felt that they really, they needed to know more than just about uh, Miyazaki, although of course he is the main, uh, kind of has been the main director, the most well-known director in Ghibli. Uh, so I wanted to introduce him to um, other, other people who are important in Ghibli. Uh, Miyazaki is here on the left, the screen. Uh, in the middle is Toshio Suzuki, who's the irrepressible producer of, uh, of uh, and has been for many years of, of Ghibli products. Uh, and then to the right is Takahata Isao, uh, kind of the other main director who uh, sadly passed away a few years ago, but has made an important cultural force. So I'll be mentioning, I'll be talking mainly about Miyazaki's work, but I do want to bring in Takahata's as well. So back to my course for a minute. Uh, one very interesting thing about teaching a popular culture course is that students come in with strong feelings uh, about the work. Uh, they've grown up with Disney or Ghibli or whatever, and they, they feel very intensely about it, sometimes quite passionate. And so I was very curious to see what kind of, of perceptions they had of Ghibli coming in and whether this would change as we, we move through the course. And this is really how they saw Ghibli, uh, certainly at the beginning of the course, uh, entertaining. And indeed, uh, Studio Ghibli works are very entertaining. They're, they're uh, fast paced, good stories, great music, great imagery. Uh, they're just a lot of fun to watch and, and very, and they have a kind of distinctive quality to them that makes them even more fun and, and kind of unique. Uh, part of that uniqueness has to do with how beautiful they are. Uh, just the imagery is simply stunning. Uh, Miyazaki himself is um, an artist and he creates his own storyboards. And these uh, can be uh, thousands and thousands of pictures that he creates by hand. Uh, Takahata was not, uh, did not do his own animation, uh, but he was extremely detailed and careful um, at uh, looking over the animator's work and has created such beautiful uh, movies as Princess Kaguya and Tale, um, Grave of the Fireflies. Um, another uh, aspect of, of Ghibli that people seem to see is that it's hopeful. There is some, a uh, real, um, there's a sense of joy in, in Ghibli films, a sense of possibility uh, that is, of course, very, uh, what, the delightful aspects of it. It is a family-oriented um, uh, studio, and so hopefulness is, is an important uh, message to convey to, uh, to families. Uh, also has great characters, um, many of whom are female. This is kind of a big deal. If you go back to the 1980s, there were very few strong female characters uh, in any films across the world, and certainly in, in Hollywood as well. But but right out of uh, the sort of the gate, uh, Miyazaki in particular was creating very interesting, independent, smart, curious, adventurous uh, female characters. And finally, uh, immersive worlds. And this goes into all this, the beauty, the entertainment, the hopefulness, the great characters. Uh, there is a, an attention to detail, uh, a kind of world building that goes on in both the uh, gorgeous, the landscapes and also the architecture, uh, uh, whether it's Europe or, or a utopian place out, out of this world or uh, a countryside in Japan that le leads you to believe you're actually 
at the time you're in the movie, you're actually in there. You are part of that immersive experience. Now, all of this could probably be said of, of Disney works as well, pretty much. Uh, although Disney got a little bit, was a little bit slower on having really strong independent female characters. Um, but where we do diverge uh, is what I have uh, touched on earlier, is what I would call the dark side of Studio Ghibli. Now, saying dark does not mean that they do dark deeds and, you know, or corrupt or anything like that. I mean that the studio is uh, the kind of work of the studio is often more complex, more nuanced, uh, and um, and deeper than people tend to think when they when they first see the movies as fun, immersive, entertaining. And here are some of the things that I think are that that Ghibli does bring up that I think are are very important aspects of the work. And I think one reason why uh, Ghibli works are becoming ever more popular because they're, they touch on the complexities of the world today. Uh, first one is trauma. Uh, they, these um, movies do not shy away from traumatic events. Uh, these include, uh, I was mentioning earlier um, to uh, Jabari and Endosan about uh, the traumatic moments that you could only have in, in a fantasy animation as in spirited away when the young girl Chihiro uh, comes back from exploring uh, and finds her, her parents at a restaurant and they've been turned into pigs. That's a very traumatic moment, obviously. And I've had some of my students say, God, I couldn't, I couldn't sleep for weeks man, after when I saw that as six years old. Um, but it's really a trauma about uh, the kind of changing of yourself vis-a-vis -vis your parents, the sense of being on your own and having to deal with really, really complicated, scary stuff, uh, but beautifully done in an animated way. Um, ambiguity. This is something that... Um, you really don't find in Disney or in most Hollywood movies. Uh, Ghibli movies not only acknowledge ambiguity, but sometimes they welcome it. Uh, you don't necessarily have an obvious happily ever after closure in, in Ghibli works. Um, it's again, uh, the world is a complicated place. You don't necessarily know for sure what, what is, what isn't, what should be. And, and that's the way it is. And, so, and we have to kind of deal with that. And Ghibli films, I think, help us deal with that. Loss, uh, this is very important. Um, there are all kinds of losses in Ghibli films uh, from uh, the loss of life in Takahata's Grave of Fireflies, which is set during the war uh, uh, very concretely to a more what I call ambiguous loss. When you're not sure of what you're losing, you're, you don't know what exactly what's happening, but you do have a sense of something, something wrong. And I think oddly enough of, of um, My Neighbor Totoro, which is a a lovely movie about two children moving to the countryside, but they have to move to the countryside because their mother is sick and she's in the hospital and they don't know whether she's coming back. And they don't really want to think about that uh, in their you know, kind of conscious minds, but it's always there. And they also, in a way, they are losing a part of childhood that they don't really know what they're losing because they've never had a mother. They haven't had a mother at home for a long time. And I think this, this really works into contemporary concerns right now. I think of my students or all the students at, at around the world at, uh, um, who you know, came in during COVID and were expecting a kind of particular freshman year or particular senior year or whatever, or, uh, and just, you, know, you don't really know what you've lost, but you have this sense of, of, of kind of mourning for something that you, you wish you could have had. You don't quite know what it was. Um, apocalypse. This is a very big deal in um, uh, in Ghibli films, much much more so than in anything you'll find in Disney. Um, part of it is cultural and even geographical. Uh, the Japan is built uh, is, um, is a series of islands on the Pacific Ring of Fire, so it's subject to volcanoes, uh, earthquakes, and tsunami. Um, but also. Uh, the three men um, I mentioned, uh, who I showed you earlier, especially Takahata and, um, and Miyazaki, grew up during World War II, which was a devastating conflict. Uh, Takahata remembers uh, in Okayama walking through uh, with his sister trying to escape the bombings and, and just being surrounded by bodies. Um, Miyazaki uh, was four years old during the, the fire bombings of Tokyo. He remembers very vividly his street on fire. Uh, evanescence. This is again, a particularly, perhaps a particularly Japanese um, 
concept. Uh, but but we do have, of course, a sense of transience. Or there is a sense of transience in the West. But this Japanese sense of evanescence is it's connected with something called mono no aware, uh, the sadness of things. And it it's kind of paradoxical because it's both bitter and sweet. Uh, it's the time of year to see cherry blossoms. They're a classic example of evanescence. Uh, they're beautiful. We love seeing them. And we also uh, are sad when they when they are tossed into the sky by a spring wind. Um, but that makes them all the more beautiful. And I think again of a Takahata movie, uh, Princess Kaguya, which is really uh, kind of full of the sense of mono no ware, of evanescence, and even has a gorgeous cherry blossom scene. Uh, and finally, uh, cultural, political, ecological, historical awareness. These are uh, directors and artists and they're very good uh, staff, very important staff who help them out. Uh, they are very highly tuned in to what's going on uh, in the world around them, uh, culturally, politically, ecologically is very important. The environmental awareness uh, of Ghibli films has been noted from very early on, from at least the time of, of Nausicaa in 1984, and also a very strong sense of, of both uh, global and Japanese history. Um, for my students, some of the things that were they particularly noticed about um, Ghibli in this sort of dark side uh, has been uh, the fact that um, uh, sometimes the good guys don't win. And this is, again, in, in strong distinction to Disney works, uh, where you really have to have a uh, happily ever after closure. And one of my colleagues and I, uh, Roland Kels, started noticing this um, an upbeat and interest in anime, not just in Ghibli works, after 9-11, when at least among young Americans, when they began to realize that things do not always work out well, that sometimes you just do have to deal with the fact that that people uh, that 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 things fall apart. Uh, even more um, importantly, is something that my my students even even today, even the ones coming into my class, sometimes have real problems with, particularly if they're they're coming out of a more Disney focused orientation. Um, sometimes you don't know who the good guys are. And this can be very upsetting to my students because they want to make, know who is a good guy and who is a villain. Um, and this is most clear in um, Miyazaki's, one of his masterpieces, the 1997 Princess Mononoke, which features this strong female leader, Lady Eboshi. And Lady Eboshi could come across as a villain. She's in charge of a in large industrial plant uh, well, for at least a 14th century version of an industrial plant that, that's an iron foundry that makes weapons to wage war against the, the beasts of the beasts and gods of the forest. Now, in a kind of a typical good versus evil world, Eboshi would be evil, evil, evil. Um, but in fact, as we find, as we continue with the movie, we understand that she is actually doing her best to, in a difficult situation. Um, she is actually, her foundry supports uh, marginalized others from, uh, from the sort of dregs of society, such as uh, women who've been in uh, prostitutes or even sufferers of handsome disease, victims of, of social discrimination. And she is, uh, she's trying to kind of have her own territory. And this in includes waging war against the beasts of the forest. But the beasts of the forest, although, you know, and again, in a typical more Dis Disney film would be kind of cute and cuddly. These are themselves kind of complex creations who are uh, quite, uh, can be quite intimidating. So it's um, it's a work that refuses to, to give us a, a bad guy. Uh, in contrast to uh, Disney movies, uh, which um, I'm thinking about Disney's Tarzan, which has certain similarities to Princess Mononoke. It's about uh, humans coming to a, uh, an animal dominated world and, um, and connecting with them. And in this case, we have a very clear villain, a man named Clayton, who's you know, indiscriminately firing on animals and he's going to take them into zoos and just generally a very bad person and uh, with no nuance, nothing. We just, we know exactly Clayton's bad, everybody else is good. Um, but do we have to have a bad guy all the time? I would say no, 
I mean, sometimes we do, sometimes it's comforting to have a bad guy because it makes it easier for us to focus our, our concerns and worries. Uh, but the world is a complicated place and people do, um, th things do fall apart, things, things don't go as you like and, and you can't always blame it on some, some evil creature or person. Uh, so how does this very different worldview uh, have an effect on American animation? Now, I'm talking about Ghibli today, but I, I should say that, that anime in general uh, has, has a darker worldview. And it's, I think it's no accident uh, that this worldview has become uh, you know, much more uh, accepted in an, uh, American, uh, and, uh, by, by American audiences, by non-Japanese audiences, uh, as the world, be, as people acknowledge more and more the complexities of the world, I believe that, that anime and Ghibli really help us navigate these complexities. Uh, in a way that, that American animation does not necessarily do. Um, but uh, I'm going to focus the set on Ghibli today and particularly on Ghibli's uh, influence on Pixar and Disney Studios. Pixar was originally uh, it's an independent animation studio that was uh, taken over by Ghibli, gosh, at least 10 years ago. Um, uh, sorry, taken over by Disney, sorry, at least 10 years ago. Uh, and But really, Pixar has been aware of um, uh, Miyazaki's work in particular for many decades, as is summed up by uh, the former head of Pixar, who said that at Pixar, whenever we need inspiration, we watch a Miyazaki film. And this is true uh, even now, in, since uh, after last year left the company, uh, in a uh, number of films, very, very overtly. Uh, in particular, I'm going to talk about a film called Turning Red. Uh, which just came out literally this last month, I believe in March, and it's available for streaming. I think it is uh, in screens uh, in some parts of the world. Uh, and Turning Red is a really delightful movie. It's um, made by, I think it's the first Pixar movie ever to be directed by a woman, uh, Domi Shi, and a Chinese Canadian woman. And it's the story of a young girl who, um, on reaching puberty, uh, goes through some uh, shocking and difficult transformations. And they're not the obvious shocking and difficult transformations, although that's included. There is a discussion of menstruation in the film, which is sort of controversial. Um, but her, her particular transformation is that when she feels strong emotions, she transforms into a red panda, not just a small red panda, but a giant red panda. Uh, so this is uh, difficult. And the film uh, continues, uh, sort of goes through her narrative of how she how she navigates this panda change, and and it's quite, as I say, there's it's quite delightful. It's also very funny at times. Uh, but I think you can see elements of of Ghibli in a number of things. First of all, the controversial controversial theme, or somewhat controversial, uh, that you wouldn't necessarily have in most films, or certainly not animated films. Although I should say that the subject of, um, of puberty is actually touched on in Takahata's early film uh, for the 1990s, only yesterday. So I think we actually do have, again, a, a very clear Ghibli link there. Uh, but we also have strong female characters, um, some very strong female characters in the case of the mother of um, the, uh, this young girl, and no villains per se, uh, as I said, the mother is a little, little tricky. You, you have to see the film to see, see why I'm kind of waffling on that one, but it's very clear there are no, no overt, you know, terrible villain types at all. And then finally, this immersive setting uh, achieved through beautiful use of lighting, quite pioneering, uh, that transforms Toronto, which can be a fairly traditional bit gray city. I, I can say this because my brother went to University of Toronto uh, into a kind of fairyland version of Toronto. It's quite delightful. Uh, and it really, the, the Toronto becomes a kind of character uh, in the movie itself. Uh, there's one other element um, that I think is, is quite obviously a, um, uh, an inspiration from Ghibli. And that would be in the figure of the panda. Uh, I don't think I'm the only person who has noticed that um, the panda really has a lot of interesting resemblance to uh, perhaps uh, Ghibli's most iconic creation, uh, the fuzzy uh, forest spirit known as Totoro. And in fact, this is not a coincidence. Domi Shi, the director of Turning Red has said, 
my secret goal from the beginning was to create our own version of Totoro. So now we know. Uh, and um, she's in some ways very successful. Uh, as she said, she was trying to create this I iconic giant animal that you just want to rub your face in. And uh, definitely there's that, that side in the film. There's this feeling of this, this furry creature that is sort of all embracing, all, encomp all encompassing, and is very, very, very comforting. Uh, and that comes right out of Totoro self, uh, this kind of feeling of comfort and contentment when you deal with this, this fuzzy, large, uh, very silent creature. Um, and it's, it's right, it's from the movie itself, um, where we see uh, the little girl, May, uh, who is the first person, first of the two sisters in the film to discover Totoro. And, the, and she very quickly uh, feels comfortable with um, with Totoro and in fact ends up burying her face in his very furry um, uh, stomach and, and uh, chest and just kind of just feeling good. But, and this is where I think that uh, Turning Red is maybe kind of limiting its vision of Totoro. Um, I think there's a lot more to Totoro. And this is again where we sort of see some real differences between American and um, uh, the American approach and Japanese approach. Um, when Miyazaki was was thinking about Totoro, he definitely saw it in terms of a furry, uh, strange creature that lives in the in the forest. And he made up Totoro. Totoro is not from Japanese folklore. This is from Miyazaki's imagination. Um, but what he wanted with Totoro was more than just a cute furry animal uh, creature. Sorry. Um, and he wanted Totoro to connect to larger things, like what have we lost? What we didn't know, what we are, um, what we what we don't remember, uh, and what what are we uh, dealing with in in terms of the loss of of so many things? Uh, Totoro was made in 1988, and already uh, the stresses on the environment were painfully clear in Japan. The loss of of rural areas, the um, urbanization of Japan, and a loss of, of a kind of spirit of community. And that's really, in many ways, what Totoro is connecting with in his very eerie and uncanny way. Because uh, I would say that Totoro is fundamentally other. Uh, we don't really understand Totoro per se. Uh, he never speaks, which I think is very easy. He does grunt occasionally. Uh, so we are kind of, Totoro is something that we is, is really different and we have to um, kind of imagine, we have to take time to commune with Totoro uh, because he's not something that we, we deal with every day. Uh, and Totoro connects us with a lot of other things. Uh, Totoro is in touch with the rain. In that earlier poster, we see him uh, in, the, in this wonderful scene. Uh, the first time that Satsuki, the older sister, meets Totoro, it's during this, this rainy, dark night. And we have a feeling of, of this sense of, of rain and connectedness of, of all kinds of things, of elements and of animals. There's a frog in the pond, of rocks, of water, uh, of just a, a feeling of a larger world out there. Um, he's also in touch with the world wind in the sky. In one of the great moments in the film, we see Totoro taking the girls, the sisters, uh, on a night flight above the rice paddies, above the mountains and the trees into the clouds. And as they say themselves, we become the wind. Uh, very much in touch with nature, Totoro uh, helps the girls grow a, a garden. Uh, and not it through waving a magic wand, but through really sort of hard work and, and inspiring them to, to do this, to again, become uh, stewards and, and in connection with the, the growth processes of the natural world. And finally, I think, uh, or not quite finally, but I also see Totoro as, as in touch with just this almost sublime, numinous world that is not quite, uh, kind of close, it's very much spiritual. And I, I love this scene. Uh, on the one hand, we've seen the moon and stars and trees before, but we've never seen a, a character so other and strange. And he's sitting there blowing into an ocarina, which is a very kind of old version of the flute that's been around for 12,000 years at least. Uh, so we we have a feeling that the Totoro really takes us back in time, uh, again, into a, a larger, longer, more connected universe. Uh, and finally, Totoro connects us with silence and stillness, uh, something that you do not see much of in American animation. Uh, and 
very important moments in 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 Miyazaki and um, uh, Takahata are moments of inaction when we just have a little bit of time to kind of think and reflect and sort of see how the um, uh, the world is is going around us. Uh, and in this case, we have this is a, again from Totoro, a snail uh, going up a uh, climbing up a, a plant on a on a hot summer afternoon. And these are some of the most important moments and moments of stillness. And this is something that is being noted and incorporated into American animation. Uh, the um, uh, director of Luca, another very recent Pixar film, was very much inspired by this aspect of, of um, Miyazaki's movie making. And as uh, one of his animation supervisors says, the other thing that with Miyazaki films that is it as expressive and big as they can be, they also can be very still and quiet. Um, this is a, uh, and the director, Akara, Casaroso, you know, his story telling becomes lyrical and takes quiet moments, he takes quiet moments just to be in the world. And that's very much part of the Ghibli aesthetic. And again, very, very different from uh, what, what we mainly know of, of American movies and particularly animation. Um, another, so uh, another aspect of, of Turning Red that I do see as very, very different from Totoro is uh, and very much part of Disney's um, worldview, which is is the emphasis on anthropomorphism. Uh, much though I love the red panda and I would love to rub my face in it too and have it cuddle me. Uh, this is not the panda is much less other than Totoro is. The panda really is. It's um, the uh, the young girl. Uh, she is transformed into a panda. She talks. She speaks. She gestures. She. Um, uh, she dances, she um, cries, she wails. Uh, she is really a young girl as, as a panda. And that can be very, uh, it makes the film very appealing because we see a young girl's um, problems through the lens of the filter of this adorable giant panda. But it still doesn't leave, leave much room for any kind of animistic element. It's very much we see um, the, the panda as really a, a human. And this is very different from Ghibli, where we are constantly allowed to see uh, an animation, the brilliance of animation allows us to enter into an other world where we really aren't anthropomorphizing. We aren't seeing a human uh, in a creature. We are seeing a creature itself. And this is the, um, the night walker or the Tarabochi of, um, of Princess Mononoke, who in, in daytime is a, a deer spirit with a face. Uh, but at night becomes something that really is completely non-human, uh, non, non, uh, kind of not, not even tactile. It's sort of this amorphous, phosphorescent uh, vision. Uh, and then on the left, we have the, the, this is the god of the forest as a real sort of numinous creation. And then on the left are these small white creatures, which are tree spirits. And no, they don't look like trees because that's the point. They're the spirits of trees. They're, they're again, there's something other, different. They are part of this larger world of, of animism. Um, and what is animism? Um, from the Cambridge Encyclopedia of Anthrop Anthropology, uh, animism is a particular sensibility and way of relating to various beings in the world. It involves attributing sentience to other beings that may include persons, animals, plants, spirits, the environment, or even items of technology, such as cars, robots, or computers. And this, I think, is a very, very key difference uh, between Japanese animation and mu much of um, Western, particularly American animation, that Japanese animation is really using animation to show us this animistic world in a very and uh, often brilliant uh, ways that allow us to kind of explore our connections, uh, our interconnections with other beings. And this is not to say that anthropomorphism is always bad. Um, the, it, it can be a little limiting. Um, thinking about Bambi, uh, the really beautiful Disney film from 1942, where you have a, a beautiful vision of the forest and the forest creatures. And Bambi actually became an early environmentalist uh, tract because um, it, it dealt with things like hunting and forest fires and you know, gave some useful messages. But the fact is that the characters in Bambi are essentially all little humans. 
uh, Bambi himself, the deer, is really a young lad trying to learn to speak, to, to navigate, uh, you know, maturity. Uh, and his friend Thumper, the rabbit, is really the bratty little boy down the, the, the street. Uh, and they're very cute, but they do not really give us a sense of, of, of otherness, of, of the environment uh, of, uh, and other things as, as having their own spirits. Uh, this is in major contrast to Princess Mononoke, for example, where you have right at the beginning of the film, uh, this, this tatarigami, this, this, this creation of that used to be a wild boar, but has now become a thing of anger uh, that, that's kind of coming out at us, at the humans, and not being cute and cuddly, and uh, speaking in a very strange voice that just to mainly talk about its hatred and resentment against human beings. And it's a very shocking scene. And it really kind of makes the point that uh, there are other entities in the world, and we need to be aware of them. Um, there, there are moments in which Disney does have an other. I'm thinking about the Snow White, uh, the very first of uh, uh, Disney's major um, feature length films. There's a great scene in Snow White when Snow White is, is lost in the forest. And for a moment, we see her confronting the other and the other is very scary. It's sort of given a kind of face, but not really. Uh, she's lost in the forest, she's terrified. And, um, and she is confronting something that really is not human, that does not, is not looking out for her. Um, however, that changes very quickly. She makes friends with the forest creatures. Uh, she makes friends with dwarves. Uh, everything's great. But very interestingly, at the end, she has to leave. She, she has to leave the other, the world of others, which have already been anthropomorphized, anthropomorphized uh, within the movie. And you see her going off with her prince uh, into uh, towards the castle and literally sort of saying goodbye to all that because fundamentally Disney is androcentric, human oriented, and we need to say goodbye to all those um, uh, fascinating, adorable, uh, but fundamentally um, not uh, interesting enough to be human creations. Uh, but things change. And this is a, sort of my final uh, kind of point about how it's not just Pixar, but how Disney in general has been affected by, I very strongly suspect, uh, Ghibli and anime in general uh, in terms of their, their worldview. Uh, this is a poster from uh, Frozen 2, uh, uh, the Disney blockbuster movie of 2019. Uh, it is a poster, you'll see it's in Sami, which is the, in, uh, the language of the indigenous people in Northern Scandinavia, whose worldview uh, was an important part of the, um, the kind of creation of the film. And uh, this worldview is one that is much more connected with nature, much more sort of spirit oriented and less androcentric. Uh, Frozen 2 is actually a very interesting movie. I was quite amazed when I saw it because it really does seem to be uh, kind of break, uh, breaking some new, uh, going to some new boundaries, going across new boundaries here, uh, where you have a vision uh, almost for the first time that I can think of in, in Disney of something really uh, of, of, the, of the world as, as being full of, of other things that we are all kind of uh, connecting with. Uh, for example, this, um, they have a, a really beautiful a vision of an uh, enchanted forest in Frozen 2, uh, where the humans and a, a non-human entity, that's Olaf the snowman, kind of get lost in it. And you can see just from this picture, the feeling that the forest has almost a soul in itself. It, it really is a distinctive entity. And I think that really goes, can, can be seen as related to uh, the extraordinary forest in Princess Mononoke, where again, you have the feeling of the forest as almost sentient in itself, that um, in the case of, of Olaf, he makes uh, the snowman, he makes friends with a, 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 a gust of wind, whom he calls Gale, uh, and the wind remains wind. The wind does not become anthropomorphic. It doesn't start talking. Um, same with uh, Ashitaka in the, um, and in Mystic World, he encounters the Kodama, those little tree spirits we see, but again, they never talk. They are something other, something part of a, a larger universe that the humans are just kind of one, one small part of. Um, so I mentioned the, the uh, Kodama and the Tarabochi, the Night Walker, and this we have a, a in Prince Mononoke, we get a glimpse of the other uh, that, that we, uh, that through the magic of animation, we feel like we, we are seeing another, another larger numinous world. Uh, Frozen too 
has more than just a glimpse of the other. It actually has a very interesting confrontation with the other. And this is in the climactic sort of final moments of the movie when the chief protagonist, a young woman named Elsa, um, has to go, is going on a quest, and it is very much a quest, to, to see what's happened to her parents. And she has to cross a huge freezing cold, literally freezing cold uh, sea. And this, uh, and the ocean that she confronts, that she plunges into, is not going to be warm or welcoming or helpful or talk to her. Uh, and we see this very clearly when she encounters and confronts the, the spirit of the water. And this is seen as a noka, which is based on a Scandinavian folkloric uh, entity uh, that can be uh, each scene is both good or evil, it can take the form of a horse, it can take form of other things, but it most definitely is not something that is uh, going to be cute or cuddly and that you're not going to be able to talk with it. And it's not going to tell you uh, about his childhood or it's not going to give you wisecracks. It, it remains this, this gorgeous, strange force that is absolutely beautiful. Uh, and really, I, I have to say, when I saw this scene, I felt my, my spine tingle because there's something really going on here uh, that, that Disney is allowing that, that other otherness of the horse, which is a symbol of the water, just to remain as it is. And then we had this final great moment after she has uh, kind of uh, ridden the horse, they both together ridden out of the water and she's on the next stage of her journey. But before she goes on her journey, she curtsies to the knock uh, in a sign of respect. They never speak. She simply curtsies and the knock bows to her. And it's, it's a moment that really could only come through in, in animation at this point. I think this, this sense of, of just the uncanny mystery uh, of two different kinds of, of entities uh, engaging with each other, a human and a water spirit. I think it's just beautifully, beautifully done. Um, so I wanted to uh, give you one last uh, picture of Totoro, because Totoro, I think, kind of even from the early 80s, sums up some of the things that I'm trying to, to that I think that Ghibli is trying to convey here. Uh, and I might mention in the early part of this, uh, early iteration of this poster, um, it was uh, the, it's a Konohen no Nikimono wa Mara Nihon ni Iru no desu. This is the, the way the poster comes through. Uh, this kind of strange creature still lives in Japan, probably. Uh, but in the original, uh, Suzuki had said, oh no, you should say Konohen no Nikimono wa Mara Nihon ni Inai. Uh, this, this kind of, of creature is, hen, strange creature, does, no, does not live in Japan, probably. No longer lives in Japan probably. And Miyazaki said, no, 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 that's not true. He probably does live in Japan. And I think that's the key, that in Miyazaki's world and in Ghibli's world, the Totoro can be out there. It's through the imagination, it's through animation that we open up to the possibilities of something being out there in the forest uh, that we uh, can finally encounter uh, and and grow to to learn from and respect and enjoy, but never, but never make it into uh, simply another version of humanity. And um, so I'm gonna end with uh, this um, quote from Roger Ebert. I think most of you are watching, probably are watching because you like animation, but there are people who say, you know, what is all this? Yeah, it's all very nice, all this animistic stuff and very cute, um, but does it really help the world? And, you know, I would say, absolutely it does. Uh, popular culture is something that very much affects uh, the way we look at the world, the way we approach the world. And I think with um, and animation in particular, because it's so protean, because it is so capable of, of opening doors and opening the universe in a very special way, really allows us to uh, have new approaches to a world that I think increasingly is going to need new approaches as the future comes towards us. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Professor. Uh, I'd like to open that up for a Q&A. Uh, please use the raise hand feature and when prompted, please state your name and ask your question. Don't be shy. Oh, here we 
we go. Yes, Anne. Yes, hi. Um, I was, you know, I, I love uh, the uh, Miyazaki films and I've always thought of them as complex and was interested in, um, you know, you're talking about them as uh, addressing trauma. And it made me wonder whether uh, you've looked into any connections with Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, which also Fred Rogers really, in a, you know, very pointed way, made a point of addressing the traumas in society uh, and not, a, not avoiding those. And also it was something that was focused on children. Wow, that's really interesting. Um, I don't know that much about Mr. Rogers, although I saw the film about him. Um, as I recall, uh, he had a very kind of warm, peaceful, welcoming quality to him. Uh, you know, his sweater, his shoes, um, that was sort of, a, um, to me, it seemed like almost like a kindly uncle or someone who would, as you say, bring up very difficult things in a way that wasn't too scary, that wasn't too intimidating. And uh, from that point of view, yes, I think that, uh, you know, doing this for children in a way that is um, a little bit not not obvious. I mean, in a funny way, I think that that Ghibli is more overt because they're dealing with almost very extreme situations like you know, apocalypse or your parents turning into pigs or something. Um, but with Mr. Rogers, it was a very gentle way of, of uh, kind of leading people through traumatic uh, events. And uh, I think it's indeed very therapeutic. Um, one thing I feel, and I, I sometimes go on about this, is I think animation and fantasy are, as opposed to kind of having a human being, are have a very specific, uh, special kind of function, which is that they allow us to look at things from arm's length. That, uh, you know, fantasy in itself is unreal, animation is unreal. So we can have, what, what's ironic is um, in many ways how very credible and realistic uh, the works of Studio Ghibli are uh, and how believable the characters are, uh, but they are, in this, this different kind of world. And I think it actually helps us to look at things like, as I said, with Spirited Away, the parents being turned into pigs uh, is not, it, it's very brilliant, fascinating, scary, wonderfully animated moment, but it also leads to uh, a young girl kind of being on her own, uh, learning to help herself, learning to make friends who support her. And uh, all this is very believable, but the fact that she does this in this, this gorgeously fantasy, fantastically animated world, perhaps means that the lessons that you're learning are a little bit um, more, they kind of come in a little bit more subtly. And I wonder if that can be helpful too, as you, you grow up and you see things, you don't necessarily think of your parents as pigs, but, but you're aware that, that sometimes parents can appear to be, be very strange. And I think that the very, um, again, the sort of the way that uh, the, the defamiliarization, we call it in, in animation and fantasy, that we take a realistic setting and change it a little bit, that that can actually have a, a very strong impact. Yes, uh, uh, Aziza. Hello, good morning, bonjour, uh, from Toronto here. <laughs> really? Yes, which is oh, not great at all. Yes, um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I, this year is actually the 30th anniversary of Naoko Takeuchi's Sailor Moon. Oh yes. Manga, the most popular manga of all time. Beautiful anime series, wonderful movies and music and you know, in Sailor Moon, you also see these empowered young women with their own stories and these embodiments of the natural world in the form of villains or spirits or princesses, Princess mm -hmm. Snow Kaguya. And I was yeah. wondering if you saw any relationship between Hayao Miyazaki's work and Naoko, Naoko-san. Um, cool. Uh, I know it's the 30th anniversary. I mean, I was there at the beginning. <laughs> I took my daughter to Japan and we scooped up <laughs> Sailor Moon paraphernalia by the by the bucket. Um, I'm just, yeah. I, so 30 years ago would be, sorry, what, what year? Um, 90, 92? Yeah, 92, 93. Yeah, okay. Um, so 
I do know a little bit about Sailor Moon, how it came about. And I remember when um, I had friends in the uh, publishing industry uh, who told me that when when this was first, uh, when Takeuchi-san, the creator, first proposed this manga, there uh, some people just wanted to turn it down because they said, why would you want to have a manga about empowered girls? And they were wrong. <laughs> they were really wrong. Um, I actually wonder if it might even be the other way around a little bit that because by then you had um, uh, in you had, by, but Ghibli had been operating since the 1980s and you have Naushika, uh, the Valley of the Wind, which is 1984, uh, which was actually sort of contributed to the founding of Studio Ghibli, who is a very, very powerful, impressive uh, young girl. And we also have um, uh, sort of girls with magical powers, including one with a pendant in, um, uh, Laputa, um, Castle in the Sky, Laputa. Um, and uh, you have a witch, a young witch in Kiki. These are all 1986, 1988. Um, so I, I wonder if they, they may have been partly, uh, Takuchi san may have been slightly influenced by uh, Ghibli works. One thing I do think that is very distinctive is, of course, having a group of girls, which is very, very impressive. And uh, by the way, I don't know if you've seen um, Turning Red. I hope you have as a Toronto resident. Um, but there's a that uh, the Domi Shi, the um, uh, director, also very much acknowledges the importance of Sailor Moon uh, as a uh, an influence on on the, her movie. And there's a great scene when when the um, uh, the the young girl's aunts are coming to the rescue and they all kind of had their special um, pendants or rings or something that kind of they they sort of turn on and I thought oh yes no, this is this is so great it reminds me of Sailor Moon so yeah I think there are all kinds of interconnections that go back and forth that's one of the pleasures of, of being of dealing with this industry right now. Great, thank you. Sure. Someone else, questions? <laughs> I guess it's early. Yes. Okay, yes. Um, Alex, Alex, yes. Um, I think you're uh, yes. muted. It's mute. <laughs> Hi, it's it's good to see you, Professor Napier, after yes. 11 years since I graduated. It's awesome. It's really <laughs> nice. I saw your Hello. name. I thought, wow. Hello from Tokyo. I live in Tokyo. Wow. <laughs> so um yeah this is amazing it's like being back in your class again uh, <laughs> after 11 years um and i i saw turning red recently as well as um uh encanto and encanto yeah. also has this like the the magical house itself is this kind of entity uh and it's very interesting to, to hear you talk about these recent trends in Disney and Pixar that are influenced by Ghibli and, and Japanese animation more broadly. Uh, but I'm curious if, if you could share your thoughts on uh, some other trends that you may be seeing perhaps from the Japan side or maybe from some smaller studios or from, from Europe, for example, that may be related to this. Wow, yeah, um, I mean, Actually, it's quite interesting. There's, I just read recently a white paper on uh, the animation industry uh, right now. And there's a lot going on, as you probably know. Uh, many of you watching this probably know as well. Uh, animation is becoming more and more popular world worldwide. And adult animation, uh, and by that I don't mean pornographic, but adult-oriented animation is really starting to have a very strong foothold, uh, which is a major trend in itself. I mean, this has been going on for a while, and that was very much influenced by anime, but it, it's really becoming a, a big deal as, as more and more people, and again, I keep wondering about the world around us that we are turning more towards animation. Maybe it's just partly because of, of digital media being so ubiquitous, or are we more accepting of, of animation as a way of, of portraying um, some of the complexities of, of the world. But um, yeah, I'm thinking about, um, I don't know that much about Europe. I mean, I know uh, the, the group behind them, uh, this is fairly old by now, the Book of Kells, uh, Song of Song of the Sea. I mean, these are, that's I believe an Irish, um, a um, studio, and they create very beautiful works that are, you know, have that kind of otherness, uncanniness, mystical quality that I think is is very Ghibli esque. Um, and in general, I think that animation and anime are 
you know, branching out. And one thing that's a very interesting trend to me that I kind of wonder if it's how it's going to play out is uh, that American studios are now consciously trying to link up with Japanese studios, trying to include more anime inflected works. And, and so I worry a little bit, and you know, what are you gonna do? Uh, that this may dilute uh, a bit, this um, the, the, sort of the quality of Japanese anime, which is so distinctive. But at the same time, you know, it, it also shows how successful anime has been. And, um, and how, I mean, also, you know, it's a tough industry. You need, um, it's incredibly long hours, very low wages. Um, you know, it's, it makes sense for them to be kind of, uh, you know, connecting with uh, non-Japanese uh, animation companies. But I think that's another big trend that um, what what's going to happen there. And I don't really know, you know, I'm a little, as I say, a little bit uncertain, but so there's a lot going on. Thank you. Well, it makes me excited to see what's coming. <laughs> yes. Um, Jonathan. Um, hi, uh, Professor Napier. That, that was a really amazing lecture. And um, what's really interesting is like growing up with uh, a lot of the Miyazaki films and Disney films growing up and um, living in Hong Kong, it never occurred to me to sort of um, break it down to think of it as female protagonists or particularly environmental. It was just, you know, all animation and taken as, as a kid. And it's really interesting as I got older, um, all those things you pointed out, just very markedly clear how um, Totoro, even Totoro, the, uh, one of the earliest ones is very, very environmental. Um, mm -hmm. And like you said, those quiet moments in between. Um, and the question I want to ask is that over the years and every year, I feel like Miyazaki says that this is the year he retires and he doesn't. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you feel in first in Japanese animation, then animation as a whole? I mean, that would you feel it's uh, uh, that the Miyazaki studios first will lose some of his um, storytelling? Um, I've seen the more recent, one of the recent ones was The Peach Princess. And I feel like that's great, great storytelling. Um, but I also know recently when they've taken up more Western stories and incorporated it into their, their, um, their, their films. Um, do you feel for the future of Miyazaki Studios where it will become less Miyazaki, if that makes any sense? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I'm just curious, the Peach Princess, you don't happen to know what the Japanese name for that one. No, I, um, I, but I'm, I, oh God, no, I'm, I'm horribly okay. afraid that I've got it the wrong studios. I think it was, it was one of the films that they made after he retired. Okay. Um, um, yeah, there is the, a new um, film that came out um, after he retired, quote unquote, a couple. Um, hmm. And um, yeah, I think, um, I think that's a huge and little bit worrisome question about what happens after Miyazaki retires. I mean, he's working again on another film, but he is, heavens, he's, he's 81. And um, these are incredibly time consuming, effortful productions. As I said, he apparently is still doing uh, this preliminary sketches by hand. I mean, it, it's extraordinary. And I'm sure the film will be amazing, but yeah, he can't go on forever. Uh, there have been over the years, attempts to kind of create a, a second generation of Ghibli directors. Uh, one of the most uh, saddest things was a young man named, a youngish man in his 40s named Kondo Yoshifumi, who uh, okay. did um, yeah. Mimo Sumasiba, I believe, um, and a beautiful film. And, um, and unfortunately he died of an aneurysm yeah. in the mid forties. So, so he would have been like, he really did seem to be kind of, uh, kind of channeling. Project. The exact protege, thank you. Uh, with other people, I mean, I just don't know. There, you know, there's a lot of um, hope or emphasis on Miyazaki's son Goro, and who has produced another couple of films um, that are not bad. They are, I think, he would himself acknowledge very heavily. Uh, so yeah, that that's that was another hard. thing because Earth Earthsea. Um, I'm also a, you know big fan of Ursula Le Guin. I've read yeah. you know films of Earthsea, and I was really looking forward to that adaptation and it's just sort of it, it wasn't bad that's the thing it was just sort of like yeah. it, it felt it was difficult it was sort of Miyazaki had a way of saying a uh, telling a story but the Ursula Gwynn had all so these it, details yeah. which, it, and 
I, I couldn't put my finger on it. And, and it was also difficult because I really wanted his son to do, to be successful, right? And oh, then yeah, there's, the whole, <laughs> there's the whole director's and uh, a father-son dynamic. Exactly. And I've heard stories, again, these are just stories of mm -hmm. how he kind of walked out midway on the first viewing. And it's like, oh God, that's that's really painful no matter how, how you see it. And, and it's, yeah, it's, you know, it's very painful because you want everybody to do well, and especially for the the, the son to do well, to continue, whether it's his way or not, yes. um, the, the storytelling. So I've, I imagine that they would continue with the level of storytelling, even if they don't have the same um, like approach to environmentalism or female protagonists. I, I hope they will. I will say that um, sometimes you need to look outside of Ghibli. I do think that uh, Makoto, Shinkai Makoto uh, works in uh, Your Name and Weathering With You, that, yeah. that has a kind of, of glow and, and you know, quality to it that I would say is, has, it's not Miyazaki because no one is Miyazaki, but, but it's Shinkai doing a remarkable thing. Uh, Yone, uh, Yone Bayashi, who's a former Disney person, uh, Ghibli person, uh, has done some very interesting things. They had their own studio, a much smaller one. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not giving up, but I, I do worry a lot about Ghibli in particular. Thank um, you so much. Sure. Nice talking with you. Uh, looks like we have another person, um, Denise. Yeah, hi. Thanks again for uh, Echo Everyone's. Thanks for joining us today. Um, we, you spoke a lot about uh, Ghibli's use of female protagonists and being at the forefront of um, you know, female empowerment, particularly with the times. But on the other hand, we also, all the animators that are you know, very famous and that you've mentioned today are all men. Yeah. Um, and even now, when you talk about, when, when Johnny was talking about um, succession, it's, it's the son of so-and-so and other male names. Do you know much about um, female involvement in the animation um, industry? Um, first of all, you're absolutely right. It's still highly male dominated and not just in Japan, but in America as well. That's why it's so exciting that um, Turning Red is, has been made by a female director. And by the way, Frozen 2, um, one of the directors was female. She was a co-director, but that still is a, a big milestone. Uh, and other ways, um, Japan is, is still even more, more um, male oriented. Uh, again, part of the problem is just how incredibly difficult and um, you know draining this work is. And if you want to have a family, and even now in Japan, there's still much more of the traditional uh, aspect of of women kind of taking more of the housework. It's really hard to to climb up too high in the animation industry. Um, having said that, first of all, Ghibli did have some major uh, women staff members, particularly um, Michio Yas Yasuda Michio, who is a colorist, and you know, color is so important in Ghibli works, and she was incredibly important. She died a few years ago. Um, what the what I know now is one of the most interesting and and really impressive studios that I know of is a uh, Kyoto Anime, a Kyo Anime, and that the only trouble is it had a very tragic history. I don't know if you're aware of that or people listening. Um, it was a uh, a, it's a surprise a, an anime um, uh, studio in Kyoto, um, which had a large number of female employees and female animators and has uh, creates uh, films that are very distinctive, very beautiful. Um, I'm thinking of, uh, oh gosh, uh, Suzumi. Oh yeah. Oh, darn it. I'm losing it. But um, uh, Violet, Violet Evergarden, uh, beautiful, beautiful films. Um, uh, the tragic aspect was it two years ago, the studio was set on fire, and um, you know, I think 18 people were killed, and many of them, most of them were women. It's awful. I, I don't know what's happening to it now, but it was it stood out in the industry for having a very good pay and for for having a large number of very expert women uh, animators. So uh, they're the ones I'm most familiar with. I don't know what's happening with them now. Again, I think in general, the industry is is so kind of heavy duty uh, that it is it's going to be hard for it to have the flexibility to do that much change, I'm thinking, but I don't know for sure. But um, yeah, you raise very important questions, and I think it's not just in Japan, but in, in um, the rest of the world as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for your wonderful uh, presentation. Thank you for all the questions. And I'd also like to thank Jabari Dunham Carson, uh, mm -hmm. our Associate Director of Regional Programs at Tufts, for making this event possible.
And uh, thank you so much all for logging in. Yeah, thank okay. you for your questions. They were great, really interesting. I really appreciate them. Yeah, no, it's am it was amazing. Um, thank you. Thank you all for logging in. Have a great night or uh, great Bye. day. Don't want to thank you. Thank you.